is Ben Arsinas and El Filipus Tres for reference. The first crime fiction novel in Philippine history is a story about a serial killer. It was published in 2001 and is one of the few English-written Filipino novels to have been reprinted more than once since its publishing. That sounds like a lie on paper and read out loud, but like consider, right? There aren't any serial killings in the Philippines. Look it up, there are zero reported cases of serial murders in this country. Now, the fact that it's zero reported cases in itself is suspect, considering the state of this nation's police force and the biases in its system, but the point stands. Zero. Now, I'm not gonna make up a theory on as to why that is, because there's not really a set reason why serial killers do what they do, you know? Today, though, we're gonna be talking about that first crime fiction novel. <laughs> Smaller in Smaller Circles is a crime fiction novel written by Felisa Batacan and was published by the University of the Philippine Press in 2001. She went on to write a sequel short story 12 entire years later. The book has since been adapted into film. Smaller and Smaller Circles is a 2017 mystery drama film directed by Raya Martin, director of other films like Manila and Independencia. The screenplay was written by Ria Lemjap and Moira Lang. And the film was produced and distributed by the same studios that brought you hit films like Goyo, Lingua Franca, Bliss, and Birdshot. Now, if you're an old-time viewer, you already know what my take is on book-to-screen adaptations. If you haven't watched my Hill House video yet, please do. I actually had fun researching that one, even though I hated turning it into a video. But this isn't gonna be a did the film live up to the novel type of video. For one, that's gonna be really hard to pull off considering it's a crime novel. And for another, this is one of the few book-to-screen adaptations in Filipino cinema that I actually like that isn't required reading or viewing in schools or a Wattpad story. <laughs> Not that studios have recently adapted Noli and El Fili properly yet. So yeah, I'm giving it some slack. Mostly because it's not really a film or book I get to hear about outside my circle of friends. And I really like them both. <laughs> I'm gonna be talking about the writing and yes, there are going to be some comparisons and critiques here and there, but nothing too serious. Heads up for spoilers for the novel and the 2017 film, by the way. It's gonna be hard avoiding spoilers considering it's a crime and mystery, so... So if you want to watch the film, it's up for free with English subtitles on YouTube. I'll have it up in the cards and in the description. If you want to read the novel, I highly recommend buying and reading it. I'll link to where you can get it in the description and as always, we'll be giving supporters a free copy if ever they want to read it or in some cases reread it. Note, the following plot points will be compared to real life news and events. All stories are influenced by the lives of the people writing them and a lot of great Filipino novels make extensive and accurate commentaries on Philippine society. In most cases, people will scoff and tell me that comparing reality to fiction minimizes the impact of these topics, but you're going to have to eat your words this time, besties. The Summary Content warning for graphic depictions of gore. Father Gus Sainz, a Jesuit priest who does extensive forensic work as a professor in a local university, is approached by NBI director Francisco Lastimosa about a curious case of two boys' corpse showing up in a landfill in Payatas. It might sound a little unremarkable and like something that a certain author ripped off in a certain book, except for the fact that both of their faces have been peeled straight off their skulls, their hearts and genitalia also having been extracted. Sainz and longtime friends slash son figure Father Jerome Lucero are tasked to pick up the slack during campaign and typhoon season to hunt down the person responsible and to understand why exactly they're doing it. Oh, and there's a corrupt system of policing, of clergy, and having to deal with the elites. Apart from them being priests, it seems like a run-of-the-mill noir story, doesn't it? The bureaucracy. Content warnings for discussions of mass murder. The source material itself is very much a period piece. From chat rooms with Father Jerome, their music in the laboratory, politics, up until the mention of Father Science's involvement with the search for the desaparecidos. Pause now for the general description. These factors lend to the story's overall noirness. 
But one of the biggest factors in that noirness is dealing with the most infuriating people in positions of power. Benjamin Arsenas, an attorney that they work with who's in league with someone who was supposed to take up the mantle of NBI director, is kind of one of the biggest antagonists in the novel. <laughs> The film definitely took away a lot of his agency in obstructing justice, and generally neither story gave him a consequence in that regard. Arsenas pretty much embodies everything wrong within the Philippine judicial system. He's self-serving, driven to further his career instead of his duty, and feeds into the cronyism that's prevalent within the system itself, especially during that time. A few years before the book was released, or perhaps even written, the Holtman-Chapman case trials were rather popular. A murder case in Dasmariñas village where the murderer in question was literally the former chief justice's son and the former justice under secretary's brother. It took them five years, two dead men, and three witness accounts to reach a verdict and consequently it ended with the death penalty being restored. It's easy to see where the basis and inspiration lies. The system favors nepotism and a claim above helping the citizens it was tasked to help. Arsenas, an attorney working closely with the National Bureau of Investigation, has enough sway to lead an investigation down a ditch in order to seem like he didn't have a single shitty case on his record. And it almost works. Additionally, in one of the earliest scenes he has with Father Sainz, and I believe the first scene he has with Director Lastimosa, he tries to cut corners in service of a client he thinks is more important, Agribank. More important than the two unknown children from the slums whose mutilated bodies were found in a landfill. Arsenas has removed a pen from his pocket and is twiddling it through his fingers idly. It's probably just some drunken or drug crazed pervert who got angry when he couldn't get his way. We see it all the time, especially in slums like Bayadas. When there is no reaction, he forges on. I'm not saying that we shouldn't investigate this, but I don't get the extreme focus on it. We've got bigger, more pressing things to take care of. During the height of Marcus's administration, the upper middle class and elite experienced the best years of their lives. Hell, if you had a governor in the president's pocket, you definitely also experienced some of it if you were in the lower middle class. In high enough positions, it was normal to hear about bribes and favors being passed around for career mobility, and the more folks these public officials had on their careers and salaries, the less focus they paid to the public they're sworn to protect. This is incredibly common to this day. And during the year the film was released, I guess you could say not much has changed about that. 2017 was one of the heights of the near constant amount of extrajudicial killings of drug users, dealers, and people who were just suspected to be either. Starting from 2016, it was common to see at least three or four raids that ended in alleged shootouts in the news. Some where people died in custody, most where people died in the streets because they allegedly fought back or made attempts at their own life. The gravity of this situation is very apparent in the way this film portrays the NBI and its constituents. In the novel, Arsenas is incredibly antagonistic and portrayed pretty downright evil. There's even the presence of your run-of-the-mill noir good cop. Despite its ambiguity, some of the message is clear. Lawyers in high positions bad, cops in lower positions good. Innocent until proven guilty is cushioning for people to have a chance of getting away with a crime they actually committed. That's not to say that the film didn't do that either. The cops were still pretty much held up to uh, these guys are the good but misunderstood guys standard. <laughs> but during its release, views around law enforcement was pretty bad. I mean, they were publicly saying that the Commission on Human Rights should be shut down, like on the news, on camera specifically for asking to clarify what exactly went down during those encounters and raids. Crime statistics are chronically underreported or misreported across the country, as law enforcement officials at every level try to massage the numbers to create the illusion of better performance. Discrepancies have been estimated in as many as 60% of crime incidents, with some station commanders seemingly more interested in staying in office or snagging promotions than in presenting a true picture of criminal activity in their areas of responsibility. I suppose that's also why they reduced Arsena from big bad to guy who just made a mistake. There's a lot less reprimanding given to him as well because in 2017, lawyers aren't the enemies, just like the cops aren't the enemy, and neither is the president or his orders to police, the corruption is. And it's interesting that they made that choice because the novel itself isn't shy about making its allegiances and grudges. For example, the Catholic Church. Content warnings for discussions of child sexual abuse in the church. The 
church was the largest non-governmental organization on the planet through which selfless women and men care for the poor, teach the unluttered, heal the sick, and work to preserve minimal standards of the common good. That's the line they sell you. I have nothing against the Catholic Church as a religion. Regrettably, Catholicism is a big part of Filipino culture, to the point of alienating a lot of our Muslim brothers and indigenous sisters. Such a big part, in fact, that the government prioritizes. The majority of big Muslim holidays weren't even turned into a non-working holiday until 2002 and 2009. The indigenous peoples were never given the same courtesy unless it's a fiesta that's already been largely Christianized in some way. And that's on top of stealing land for things like exotic animals or a big old stadium. Or a dam that was um, gonna be built by China. I do, however, have something against the Catholic Church as an institution. Apart from being queer, Christianity, Catholicism, and its ilk all have played a big part in historically colonizing my country, silencing, erasing, and demonizing entire indigenous cultures, keeping anti-discrimination laws for queer people from being finalized, keeping divorce illegal and annulments expensive, and hindering the progress of reproductive health in the public sector. So it's not exactly a big surprise to me that the other main antagonist for smaller and smaller circles was Cardinal Rafael Meneses, and it's even less of a surprise that one of the main reasons he's an antagonist is because he's helping cover up a fellow priest's child sexual abuse in the interest of keeping the church's image clear. There's actually also a little subplot of I think Father Emil, who was like pretty much against reproductive health um, benefits given to the local community by what's Gladys's? Name again. The politician. People who don't know um, what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. Cardinal Meneses is driven, ambitious, and thinks very highly of himself. This story really does one hell of a job humanizing its men of the cloth, which helps demystify their role as public figures. Hell, with Sainz and Jerome, they make it a point to hone in that these men are not only public figures in their religious community, but in their working community as well. Jerome is a clinical psychologist and Philippine history professor, but Sainz has been a teacher and activist since Jerome was in high school, was a professor of philosophy in France, and does forensic work for the NBI as a favor. No compensation is ever talked about. He is doing this for free, as he did for the search and identification of the desaparecidos. So, to have Cardinal Meneses really believe the hype of what people think of him, all walks of Filipino citizens hold priests to a higher regard than politicians. Meneses is incredibly aware of this, especially in the time period of the story. In the wake of Marcus's administration, the church was a great unifier during the revolution. To this day, they spin it like the moment the church came into the picture, the revolution was won. No bullets were fired. No people got hurt. But that's ignoring the peripheral. The turn of the century ushered in a bigger issue on the global scale. The Spotlight series. Now for context, the Boston Globe released a series of investigative articles looking into the child sexual abuse being swept under the rug within their local diocese. Priests whose activities were found out by more than a few people ended up being transferred to another parish or given a vacation until people forgot about what they did and round and round it went until the series came out. One by one, other countries began these investigations until all over the world you'd get abuse cases coming into the news and the fact that there isn't really a lot said about these issues currently still speaks to the power of the church all over the world. Meneses and all members of the clergy have their own opinions about how they should deal with crimes within the church itself, and a lot of these priests aren't afraid of pulling favors with the elites in their pockets. A primary example of this would be when Mrs. Urrutia, the person in charge of the Canoa de Cristo, a charity shelter for street children, made sure that science didn't receive funding for the laboratory because he kept filing inquiries into Father Isagani Ramirez. A fellow priest who, after having been taken out of his parish for rumors of molesting children, was transferred into the shelter, which is a foundation to help street children. Now, I'm aware of how brief Vanessa's appearance in the story is, but the point still stands the further you get into the novel. Taking Monsignor Ramirez out of the picture is one of the things science finds himself occupied with before even getting assigned on the Payatas case, and that's also considering the case. Content warnings for discussions of murder, child sexual abuse, and domestic abuse. The perpetrator, Alejandro Alex, was a survivor of child sexual abuse, one of nine children under the same physical education teacher. He was the one who got the worst of the abuse. 
Jerome goes into trying to understand his psyche within the novel and the film, why he does what he does to the bodies. He posits that the peeling off of the faces is either depersonalizing the victim or a form of projection on the victims themselves. But despite the amount of analysis he pours into why Alex does this, Alex doesn't actually get to explain it himself. That's primarily because the story wasn't about catching him or even understanding him. It wasn't even about preventing the crime done to the children around the Payatas area. Right at the start of the film, and in the second chapter of the novel, Jerome and Sainz get in an argument about the latter's persistence in getting Monsignor Ramirez far, far away from any more children. Maybe even arresting him if they get to that point. In the novel, Jerome is very much understanding of this perseverance to the cause. In later chapters, it's revealed that Father Lucero himself was a victim of domestic abuse. Not sexual, mind, but he would understand the need to help children who wouldn't know who to turn to when an authority figure abuses them. In the film, where they don't really give you that context, he tells science the facts. The kids won't speak up because they know they don't stand a chance. A neutral statement that sends signs into this diatribe about how, as public figures with some say in the matter, they should be responsible in making sure the kids have a chance. And that ends up being the angle the film takes. The responsibility of making sure the weakest have a fighting chance at justice. Sure, there's some centrism involved. For one, they never bring up the fact that Science was involved in looking for the desaparecidos or was an anti-Marcos activist, but it takes the factors of the novel to the furthest extreme they can take it. They even surprisingly end up mourning the loss of Alex, who Science wanted to help so desperately most of all. The novel is a different story, and this really is where they both differ despite the similar theme. Where the film strove for a moral lesson, as is customary in Filipino film, the novel strove for truth. That's why you get parts of Alex's monologues in between sections of the investigation. The novel doesn't spoon feed its readers what you should feel about what happened to Alex and how that ended up fueling his serial killing. About underpaid police officers too tired to want to audit their corrupt higher-ups. About lawyers cutting corners on cases for their record about journalists looking into police investigations for a scoop, or even about the amount of secrecy in the church that helps protect molesters and abusers. As Lestimosa states in one of the earlier chapters, it's an observation, not a judgment. Can you tell I really like these properties? Honestly, I prefer the novel, not because I'm a purist, but because they took away most of what charmed me about the novel itself. Science and Jerome's relationship in the book was paramount to the gut punches of uncovering the mystery every step of the way, including even when they were just dealing with the people making their jobs harder for them. All in all though, considering this was something written in the 90s, the relatability and read factor to the novels does not fail to astound me. The film is good, it had its moments, there are definitely just times where the screenplay kind of just fails to find a way to properly adapt the more poetic parts of the book into Tagalog, but I admire the fact that they adapted it into Tagalog at all, really. A big part of what made the book a little hard to connect to its Filipino-ness was the fact that it was almost all in English. It didn't make it hard to read, mind, but it definitely felt like a book that was making commentaries about inequality with an audience demographic of not the people it's making these commentaries for. You know, like what I say. But that was most of my thoughts on Smaller and Smaller Circles. I highly recommend it, and if you watch or read it after watching this video, please let me know what you thought about it. I'd love to talk to more people about these two things that I'm just really, really into. <laughs> A big, big thank you to Jeanette, Evie, and all of my lovely supporters. Without them, this video would not be here. So, if you want a week early access to these videos, updates on scripts, bloopers, and more, please support me on Ko-fi. You'll be paying for two videos a month, and drumroll please, I will be starting a talk show podcast with a friend. We will be releasing it and all the things involved with it this coming April. So if you like my reviews on content like this, be sure to keep an eye out on my socials. Why did I tap the mic? <laughs> Stay safe. Ingat tayo lahat. Bye!